service today, we will be having the Lord's Supper. What about God series? Today's topic, the fall of man. So if you always wondered about uh, why the flood happened, how man fell, all of those things, we will be discussing that this afternoon. Timeless Treasures Bible Study on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Uh, those of you who are older, make sure you're here for that, um, for the life of David. I understand they have a little bit of uh, food that they eat as well um, and fellowship during that time. Make sure you're out on Tuesday night for our uh, visitation. We find on Tuesday nights it's actually a little, a little bit cooler with, with the weather. weather. Um, folks, folks are usually at home and we should meet just about after supper. So we're, we're able, able to have a good time going out knocking on doors and inviting folks, folks to come out to church. church. The, the flood, flood is what we're talking about on Wednesday nights. So make, make sure you're here for that. that. The reason that we're doing this series is because we intend to go see Noah's Ark. So, so Pastor's, Pastor's going, going through all these things, things so that when you get to Noah's Ark, you'll, you'll have, have a better understanding of the different things they talk about there. there. Titus, Titus, come, come tell, tell us what's going, going on with our youth. youth. It would take uh, more time than I have to fulfill that request, but um, Briefly, we are going to Canada, this, uh, me and Brenda. And then uh, it's gonna be the youth. <laughs> the youth are invited. No, I'm kidding. But um, and then Dalton and Amber are going to uh, North Carolina, and so uh, unless Jennifer volunteers to take on the entire youth by herself, which we don't want to put on her, uh, youth group will be canceled this week. However, we will be back the next, the following week, and so don't think that you're gonna get a lot of time off. And teens, for those of you who are here, uh, don't forget about your homework. That was ominous. Don't forget about your homework. I do not see Mr. JB. Is he in here? No? Pizza party. There will be. There is a pizza party that is going to happen after Children's Church. Um, so it will be fantastic, and you'll get to eat pizza. And I think that's because they reached a certain number. They were shooting for they were 30. So because they reached 30 in Power Church last week, there will be pizza this week. From what I understand, he is paying for that pizza right now. Ladies in Fellowship Together is going to be having a pick-a-pal today, so you want to meet right after the service? Just a couple of minutes, meet right up here after the service, ladies, and you'll have your pick-a-pal. Um, and you'll find out if you don't know what that is, make sure you're here so you can find out what that is, and you can be a part of that. It's a fantastic program. Fellas, Saturday at 8 a.m. we'll be having the men's prayer breakfast, which is always a fantastic time to get together um, and share what's going on in our lives with each other and get some food. So if you want to bring some food, um, bring something already cooked, or they'll be cooking a little bit earlier than that. Pastor starts to cook usually about 7 o'clock. So be here for that, and we'll be able to spend some time together and pray. Sunday, July 22nd, we're telling you this in advance, so it's not a last-minute notice. Sunday, July 22nd, is Bring a Coworker Day. This gives you plenty of time to plant the seed, water the seed, and then demand they show up <laughs> on July 22nd. <clears throat> Saturday, the 28th, there'll be a youth activity, which is to come here, the Proclaim Team. They'll be doing some skits. And then Sunday, July 29th, the Proclaim Team from PCC will be here, and they'll be putting on a concert for us and doing some preaching for us as well. Um, it'll just be a fantastic time, so make sure you're out for that. Pastor? Okay, Josh, come on up. Josh is going to lead music for us as we continue on. And children, you are dismissed. Mr. JB, there you go.
seated. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the wonderful day that you've given to us. We thank you for your grace and all that you have done to bring us to this point today where we can be together to hear the word of God. And Lord, we pray that you would do a mighty work in our hearts. I pray for any that might be here that do not know you as Savior and Lord. We pray that you'd work in their life together today, Lord, to show them the way of salvation. And Lord, we pray for all of the believers, every single one here that has come with expectant hearts to hear the word of God, who want to worship you in spirit and in truth, that you would teach us something from the word of God today. And Lord, we thank you for all that you're going to do and all that you can do if we would just simply allow you to work in our midst. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go over our verse. I got a new one for you. We've been learning uh, Romans chapter 1 in verse 16 and 17. Now we're looking at Romans chapter 6, verse 16. And it is a powerful verse. We're going to talk about it today and kind of reiterate it over the next few weeks. For those of you that are new with us, we're going through the book of Romans through the summer months. And we're actually just looking at all the different things that we can learn. The highlights, instead of going verse by verse, which we can do, and certainly it's, it's a well worth a study to do that. But we've decided this time around to take a, a really a cursor look of the book of Romans that is a little bit lighter, but also a little more challenging because of that. We're looking at revelations that we find in Romans. And we've looked at a number of them, and we're just kind of giving you some things, some nuggets to hang on to that maybe you haven't heard of before that might change your life. And so we've been going through the book of Romans in that way. Here's our new verse. It's Romans 6, 16. And so the Bible says this. Don't say it with me yet. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey... Now, it assumes something. That verse right there assumes that you have a choice. So you have a choice. You will obey somebody, and you'll be the servant to something. His servants, you are to whom you obey. So whoever you obey, you basically become that person's servant. And so it says, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. And so... Just looking at that right there, it says basically you have two paths that you're on. Either you're serving sin or you're serving righteousness, and you have a choice. And there's an interesting reason why he says you have a choice, because you're a believer. This verse is written to believers, those who know Jesus as Savior. You have a choice. Those who are not believers have no choice. You are the servant of sin. You're going to serve sin until you get saved. And when you get saved, now you have a choice. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But the great verse, Romans 6, 16. Let's say it together. Ready? Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Romans 6, 16. That verse is definitely worthy of of your memorizing so let me encourage you to do that let's have our ushers come forward at this time and and we'll take up the offering good to have you here do you notice the exodus when all the kids left <laughs> but there's still a good group of you here god bless you thanks thanks for being here today uh, we have had an immense blessing with our with our power church program since vacation bible school we had a high of 66 something like that 62 uh, in our vacation bible school and most of them have kept coming back which is a great blessing attributed to our bus ministry. We run the buses all the way downtown uh, area, uh, not far from Fairfield, actually just north of Fairfield. And we have a route up here. We have a route down there. So we've got a lot going on. So pray for that ministry. These kids are hearing the gospel for the first time. They're getting saved, uh, growing in the Lord. We're so thankful for that ministry. So praise God for that. And be patient with them when they come to. We let them come in and uh, have a time with us and then send them out, and JB teaches them in there. And so looking forward to seeing how God continues to work. And so that's a blessing, but we're also glad to have you with us. I know we have some first-time guests I met when you first walked in. If you'll take that and drop that little card in the offering plate, that'll help me get to know you a little better. Now I can pray for you there as well. All right, uh, just real quick as far as the uh, offerings are concerned, let me encourage you as you continue to give. You know, the Lord has blessed us immensely uh, this summer. And we want to thank the Lord for his blessings upon our finances. A lot of churches go down in the summer. We've, we've, we've taken a little bit of a hit, but for the most part, our finances have been good. We also have some other things to pray about, too. We do, we do a lot of love offerings in the summertime. Last week, we took a love offering up for the Burks, 
We also have some new guests coming as well. On the 28th and 29th, PCC will be here. We'll take up a love offering for them. And then in August, we actually have Dr. John Reese will be here, and he does monodramas. He's actually going to be doing Martin Luther, uh, the reformist of the Reformation. He'll be coming and doing that for us. We'll take up a love offering for him as well. So a lot of neat little things that we can do to be a blessing to people like that as well. Okay? Let's go ahead and pray. We'll ask the Lord to bless our, our offering. And Titus, if you'll pray for us, please.
wonderful to know that God is near. In all of the areas of our life, circumstances that we go through, you know that God is here with you, speaking to our hearts, carrying us through, and always there faithful for us. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, and I'm excited about the Lord's Supper we'll be having right at the end of our service But before we get to that point, I want to prepare our hearts for that. And as we go through the book of Romans, we are in the chapter mentioned, chapter 5. But before we get into that, i got a couple of funnies for you. I love jokes. I love little funny things. And these are cute. I guess a kid wrote these. I don't know. Maybe it was an adult feeling funny. Why do bees have sticky hair? You can figure this one out. Because they use a honeycomb. I like that one. Why did the cookie go to the doctor? He felt crummy. Okay, you got it. Those are cute, aren't they? Those are clean. Those are clean jokes. There's a lot of wicked stuff out there, but those are some that you can share. In our sermon series in the book of Romans, we are calling this Revelations from Romans because we're revealing things that are new, or not necessarily new, but maybe new to you, maybe new to me things that we need to learn and know. We talked about how Paul, really, as he wrote this book, we can almost say Romans is the gospel according to Paul. You have Matthew, gospel according to Matthew, Mark, the gospel according to Mark, Luke and John. Really, when you look at the book of Romans, Romans really is all about the gospel and the power of that gospel. And what we see in the book of Romans is that 
Paul was obsessed with it. It wasn't just something he talked about every now and then, but he truly was obsessed with the gospel. To so much so that he would give his life for the gospel. Not only live his life for it, but actually give his life. He would die for the gospel. And as you read the book of Romans, it is a stately book. It is full of doctrine. It is full of truth. It's full of everything, really, that you need to know for salvation and how to walk as a Christian. I would also dare say, if you only had one book of the Bible, get this, if you only had one book of the Bible, Romans would do it all. It would tell you about Jesus, it would tell you about salvation, it would tell you about the Holy Spirit, it would tell you about sin, how to have victory, how to treat one another, how to have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Romans really is the Bible encapsulated in 16 chapters. That's how great Romans is. But God gave us so much more than that, but He gave us Romans to help us to understand so much of the gospel. So as we look at Romans, these are things that we're going into. We've already seen the revelation of the gospel, how that the gospel is more than just Jesus died and was buried. What did I leave out? Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, and what's the third thing he did? He rose again. The gospel is about the resurrection. You can't leave Jesus in the grave. You can't leave him out. We'd rather go on in our sin. We go on in our mediocrity and keep our flesh still leading us every day. And yet we leave that out. So that was a revelation that we saw. We also saw the revelation of faith. That really this whole thing is about faith. It is. It's all about faith. All of this stuff that you're reading, everything that you see, everything that the Holy Spirit does in your heart, it's all about faith. You have to believe it by faith. That's how important that is. We saw the revelation of that. We saw last week the radical gospel of grace and a revelation of grace. It's the grace of God that makes it all possible. And we saw all of that last time. So today, I want to continue with chapter 5, and I want you to pick up with verse 12. And I want to talk to you about three kings. Three kings. Now, there are three kings that rule and reign in your life as a believer. At one point or another, all three of these have been part of your life. There are three of them that's mentioned in chapter 5 and chapter 6. And I want to talk to you about that today. So the title of the message is, The Reign of Three Kings in Our Life. Let's start with verse 12 and then we'll pray right after that. Uh, But look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And uh, follow along with me if you would please. The Bible says, Wherefore... As by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So that one man, sin entered into the world. Who was that one man? Everybody say his name. Adam. By that one man, one man, sin, causes everybody to be a sinner. That just doesn't seem fair. We'll get to that. For under the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And he explains, nevertheless, death reigned. There's the word reign, like a king reigns. First king, we're going to see. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned. After the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Let's stop right there and pray as we talk about these three kings. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share. I pray that you speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray for your grace. We are of all men, Father, 
truly grateful. For we sit here this morning understanding what you did. We understand by faith through the word of God that we're just sinners saved by grace. Lord, we deserve hell because of our sin. God, we were separated from you. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done to bring us together, for bringing us back together with you, Lord through your grace and all the work that you've accomplished. So, Lord, we pray for your help now. Speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Myers, can you make sure all the doors are shut? Thank you, brother. So, the first thing I want you to see is the reign of King Death. Everybody say, King Death. King Death. death. And it's really right there. We saw that in verse 12 and 13 and 14. That death reigns. Now, I want you also to understand this, that as far as king death is concerned, every one of you have king death in your life. You're going to die. And it reigns supreme in all humanity. King death. Death reigns. And you have no choice in the matter. No choice. You are going to die because you are of Adam. But beyond this physical death, also we understand that every single person that's brought into the world, death spiritually reigns also. There's a spiritual death that every single person has to deal with because you are from Adam. That just doesn't seem fair, does it? We'll get into that. Okay, just look at verse 13. The Bible says the law was given, for under the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Imputation, we talked about this a few sermons ago. The imputation means applied to you. Well, how do you know that something is wrong if you've never been told that it is wrong? Have you ever walked across some really nice grass and you realize you weren't supposed to walk on that grass? We just went to Chicago, my wife and I and our kids, and there's a lot of beautiful places downtown Chicago. I mean, it's just pristine how they take care of a lot of those places. A lot of big cities do that. Can you imagine, like my wife, every time she's, we go by, we're driving in the country, she sees some beautiful grass. She'll say, can you stop so I can take my shoes off and put my feet in that grass? I, I think I've done that once. It's just kind of weird, you know, on a highway, and my wife's running out her feet in the grass. She likes to do that. But when you're in Chicago or you're in a big city and the grass is so beautiful, it's landscaped, there's rocks, there's palm trees or whatever it might be that's all landscaped, so beautiful, and you realize there's no sign there, but you're thinking, I just want to walk on that grass. So off come the shoes, off come the socks, and you're just walking in that grass, Woo-hoo, just enjoying that grass. Then the park ranger or the park manager comes up and says, get off the grass. He said, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute, I, I didn't see a sign. There was no sign there to tell me that that was wrong. So how could it be wrong? Well, it was wrong because there was a law. There was an ordinance. You just didn't know about it. And so now you do. And so what a lot of people do, they put a sign in the yard that says, Thou thou shalt not walk on the grass. It says, keep off the grass, stupid, right? What we're finding in this passage, this is simplified, is simply this. From Adam to Moses, Adam sinned. And as you read all of the scriptures in chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, You find all those people sin, but there was no law. There was no Ten Commandments given, right? Thou shalt not kill. When was that given? Moses. A long time after Adam, after the flood. Those laws were not given. So what God is saying is the law was being broken. You just didn't know about it. So therefore, imputation of that is not applied to those people from Adam to Moses. Now, they still die. They still go to hell for another reason we're going to get into a moment. But the imputation of that law, as far as they're concerned, was not applied to them until the law came. And it said, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not bear false witness. All the thou shalt not and all the positive. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make sure that you remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You should honor your father and mother. All those Ten Commandments that are there were given so that you would know what is right and wrong. But what about before the law? Death still reigned because of sin. And that's the key. Sin and death reign in every single person's life, even before the law and after the law. 
doesn't matter. Everyone dies because of sin. The imputation of the law is even more accountability on those people afterwards. And so there's no choice. From Adam to Moses, the reason people died was because of the sin and sinful nature. The thoughts and imaginations were only evil continually, so then God sent the flood. Remember the story of the flood? Destroyed all of mankind and started over with Noah and his three sons and their wives. And so the law was given, we're told here in this passage of Scripture, to reveal the sinfulness of our soul, to help us to see how sinful we really are. You're in chapter 5. Would you look at chapter 7 real quick and look at verse 7, 7-7. Seven, seven. Paul there says, what shall we say? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, here it is. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Isn't it interesting? Sin, taking occasion by that commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And that's why, beloved, when you tell people about Jesus as your Savior, you want to say, listen, I want to win someone to Christ. Pastor, how do I do that? We tell you this all the time again and again. You have to convict that conscience. People do what they do today. They don't even realize they're doing anything wrong. People commit immorality. They do all sorts of vile and wicked things, and they don't even know it's wrong because no one's ever told them it's wrong. We have taken Ten Commandments out of the school system. What do you expect? These little kids are going to learn. They're never going to be told. So here, here's the issue. And Paul simply says, the law came, sin revived, and I died. And so from Adam to Moses, before the law actually came, people were dying, committing wickedness and sinfulness and all of that. Without the law, they still died because of their sinfulness. They will still die and go to hell. But I do believe, scripturally, that there are degrees of And so the point, the law puts parameters around our will, a line that we're not supposed to cross, and it reveals who we are, that death is reigning in me. The law simply reveals who I am, you sinner. My wife tells the story, she told me this when I was just dating her, and I still married her even though I heard her.
But anyway, the thought with this is, Debbie turned the knob, the other one, I don't care. The Ten Commandments were given to reveal our inability to measure up. That's why we die. We die because the sin nature that's in all of us is already there. The implantation of that came from Adam and Eve. Does it seem fair? No, it doesn't. You were not there. It's not fair that you are marked in your soul as a sinner. You had no choice in the matter. You were simply brought into being from your parents, darkened in your soul as a sinner. Right? And an agnostic or a skeptic or someone who hates God can use that as an argument. And they have. Why would I be a sinner? I wasn't there. And I've talked to people just like that. But beloved, you can't stop right there. It is true. God is a just God. And and you, and when Adam and Eve sinned, and their offspring, therefore all of us inherit that sinfulness. 5.12, look at it again. 5.12. As by one man, sin entered in the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all, that's you and me, for that all have sinned. We all have sinned because of that. And then he goes on. Death is reigning in verse 14. But now I want to bring to you a thought here to the second king. Now, remember Abraham? Remember the great Abraham? You remember the story of Abraham and Lot? And Lot split off with Abraham? Do you remember that? Raise your hand if you remember that story. I, I know I'm talking to intellectual people. Minus a couple of you. We'll go on with that. But Abraham and Lot separated. Remember what Abraham, whenever God said to Abraham, he told him he's going to have a baby, which is a miracle. But then he said to Abraham, they were talking, they said, shall I keep from Abraham what I'm about to do? And he was going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that story? And then Abraham, he knew Lot was down there, so Abraham said, uh, my Lord, would you spare the city if there's but 50 righteous there? And God said, I'll spare it if there's 50. And Abraham um, would you spare it if there's 40? I'll spare it if there's 40. And every time Abraham asked for mercy for that city, God always answered it, even till they got down to 10. Now, what does that tell you about our God? Is God a fair or unfair God? He's fair and he's righteous. He's just. And there wasn't 10 that were there. Think about the flood, too. Someone asked me, well, Pastor, would God, why would God destroy the entire world with a flood? Surely, with a billion people, we, we estimate about a billion people on the earth about that time, all around the world, we're finding footprints of humans in Texas. Right? Fossilized footprints in Texas with the, uh, the dinosaurs. Giants in Nebraska. We were learning all this on Wednesdays. People everywhere around the world. God destroyed them all but eight? Are you kidding me? There wasn't one... I believe if God had seen more, he would have saved them too. But he only found one. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a just man, perfect, and walked in this world of righteousness. It's unreal, isn't it? So God's a fair and righteous God. Every, he never does anything unfairly. Never, 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 never. So when it came to Abraham and Lot, Abraham knew that. And God said, I'll spare the city, but there wasn't even ten there. And he judged the city because he's a just God. Now, if you were not there in the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve sinned, and because of that, you're a sinner. Now listen, listen, you know the stakes are high. You are a sinner. And when you die, you go to hell forever and ever and ever and ever eternally. We're not playing around here. And you weren't even there. You were not an accessory to the crime. Nowhere near there. And you're going to go to hell forever. Because Adam and Eve sinned. You, you can see how the devil can use that to make an argument. But that's why there's a second king. Death reigned unconditionally. You were not there. And you will die. It is a king in your life and you will die. You die spiritually. You die physically. And you will die physically. But you, gotta, you know what? Is God a fair and righteous God? Yes. So what did he do? He gave us a second king called Grace. King 
grace. Everybody say King Grace. Let me show you that. Would you read with me now? In verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. Now keep this in mind. Don't get confused by the word many. What he's going to say here, he's comparing one versus many. One versus many, all the way through here. So through the offense of one, that's Adam, many be dead. That's you and me. But then look what he says. Much more... The grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So he says, one man, Jesus, takes care of death. Right? And not as it was by, that sin, by, by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Now get this, King Death is reigning spiritually, but now he's given us King Grace to offset King Death. Keep reading. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by that one man, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men. Even so, the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. For as by one man disobedience, many were made sinners, so the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. We could really see that we're sinners, but where sin abounded, grace much more abounded that as sin hath reigned unto death, here's your second king, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The first king is death. No choice for you. The second king is grace. God's choice for you. First king, death, no choice. Second king, grace, God's choice. Guess what? You weren't there either when Jesus died on that cross. Yet he died for you. I wasn't there when I when Adam and Eve sinned. So that's not fair. You weren't there when Jesus died on the cross. Do you still want it? It don't make sense. Why do you keep doing that? King Grace, God's choice. See, <clears throat> one man represented many in Adam, so Christ, as one man, represented many, all of us. If we trust him as Savior, we can have his grace, and grace is now reigning. Grace reigns in this world right now. All you have to do is tap into it. Reach out by faith. Trust Jesus as your Savior, and death is conquered. It's conquered. Spiritual death is conquered. 
That's why it's called born again. You know, whenever you are born physically in the world, you are born as a sinner. You are born in a, in a, in a sinful condition, destined for hell. When you get born again, you are birthed. So here's this grace. You are a sinner. Adam sinned. You had no choice. You were not there. You are not alive. King death and sin reigns in your life. But God has by grace chosen a new king to make a way for you to be redeemed, a way for you to escape this situation, this death penalty. He's brought in a gift of grace through Jesus Christ. Now when you receive Jesus as your Savior, you are alive. And now you have a new life to live. You can choose to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And for all of us here this morning, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a new king in your life. It's called grace. Can I get an amen? amen. So how many of you are saved? Yeah. How many of you done that? Have you trust Jesus as your Savior? Because you know who you are. You know if every day of your life, living and king death, king sin runs your life. Because he's a king. He's going to rule you. So you sin. Yes, sir, I'm going to sin because that's who you are in your heart. When you trust Jesus as your Savior, grace comes in, cancels the sin, the penalty, the power can get to the third king. Now you have a choice. See, the first one, no choice. Well, look at the last verse of chapter 5. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Everybody say Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah, it's him, right? The reign of Jesus is your choice. He has taken care of it. The way that God gave grace is through Jesus Christ. I love the story of David and Goliath, don't you? Love that story. I always like it when a little guy beats the big guy. <laughs> well, you know how David is. David is a picture of Jesus all through the scriptures. David is the, we know that uh, Jesus will be called the son of David. He's in the line of David the king. He's in the line of David in so many ways, so many spiritual pictures. David after man's, God's, uh, God's own heart. Well, David, when he killed Goliath, was a beautiful picture also of this right here. One man representing many. See, when you had the Philistines there in the valley <clears throat> of Elah, and they were up on one side and the Israelites on the other side, and the big giant came walking down, and the earth thundered at his steps, and the rocks trembled. And while he was standing there, he said, give me a man. He says, if I win, then all of us will be your servants. You win, send me one. And one man. Jesus Christ, when he died on that cross, now get this, when he died on that cross, he took all sin, all of death, the power of sin that was reigning over all mankind, death, 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 and Jesus hung on that cross and died. Jesus 
Jesus died. The reign of death. Hell was exploding in laughter and joy and hallelujah as we got him, we got him, we got him, we got him. We got him. In his resurrection. So when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you enter into that scenario. You enter into that fact. You trust Jesus as your Savior. You're now saved from the spiritual death. That means, get this, you will never, ever go to hell. You trust Jesus as your Savior. I do this quickly. It's your choice. King Jesus now is in your life. And so he says in chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Good question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, remember, you were a sinner. Sin was reigning in your life. But now you're not a, you're, you're saved now. Sin doesn't reign in your life anymore. Jesus is in your life. So he says, shall you continue in sin that grace can just keep on abounding? He says, God forbid. Everybody say, God forbid. You know, we don't use those words anymore, do we? Honey, would you like to have spaghetti for supper? God forbid. We just, <laughs> we just don't use that, right? It's a great word. It's actually a phrase in the Greek. It's meganoita. It means, may it never be with an exclamation point. Or, No. God forbid. And then he says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Keep reading. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? See, when you, you trusted trust Jesus, Jesus as your Savior, what he did on the cross is what you have applied to your life. So therefore, when he died, you died. The sinfulness of your soul is now taken care of. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up by the, from the dead by the glory of the Father, we should also walk in newness of life. Not just, hey, we don't go to hell. The word walk is something we do every day. Now we walk in newness of life. It's not just, hey, I don't have to go to hell. No, we now walk in a new life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, his resurrection, that power of the gospel. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that the henceforth we should not serve that sin. The body of sin is destroyed. King death, king sin is destroyed. Now don't let him serve it. Don't serve him anymore. For he that is dead is freed from sin. He's not saying you don't go to hell here. Of course, that's assumed. The penalty of sin is there. You don't have to go to hell. But he says, if you are dead, you're freed from sin. If we be dead with Christ, we believe. Everybody say, we believe. There's that faith thing again. It always gets in the way. In a good way. It's that faith thing. We believe. We believe that we shall also live with him. See, you can trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you know you're going to go to heaven. Do you trust him as your king so you don't have to sin today? That's what it's about.
King death was no choice. King grace was God's choice. King Jesus is your choice to be saved and to walk in newness of life. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he re- died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Oh, guess what? Verse 11, so you likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead and to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign. You choose. See, King Death, King Sin, still wants to reign in your life, but he simply says right here, you choose. Let not sin reign. You have a choice now. Before you didn't, but now you've got grace. King Grace is there in your life. King Grace says you can choose to say no to King Death and King Sin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Here it is. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not have dominion over me. Say that with me. Sin shall not have dominion over me. You believe that? That's the belief. You choose. When you sin as a believer, you choose to sin. You choose. It's that simple. See, when a sinner sins before he's saved, he has no choice. It's what he does. He's a sinner. King sin reigns. But when you trust Jesus as Savior, King grace comes in. Now you have a choice. I don't have sin. He gives you the power over that sin. I don't get it. Where, where, where's the flip? Where's the switch? Where I get that, Pastor? Your faith. Your belief. I believe when Jesus died on that cross, he died to take away the penalty of sin in my life and king death. But I also believe when he rose again, He gave me the power over sin's dominion in my life, King Jesus. And I believe that. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. There it is again. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? You choose. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart. You got saved. Verse 18, you're made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you've yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. Now you can yield. Yield to God. It's that simple. I have a uh, gift
single one of you, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't have to sin anymore. Okay? That's it. You don't have to. The Holy Spirit of God is inside of your life. You have that old man. I'm not preaching sinless perfection that says that old man never comes back. I say it comes back all the time. And you have victory over it every single day. And your challenge that you have as a Christian now, and really that's what it's all about. As you grow in the Lord, as you learn to become a better soldier, a better killer. time. I think those ladies just took off for the food, didn't they? We are going to have the Lord's